Welcome back to the next video in CSC 280, the introduction to cybersecurity. Today we continue our discussion about cryptography. Again, like in the previous video, don't worry about math, we're not going to bring any mathematics into this discussion. But what we are going to do is figure out how we can use cryptography um, to create digital signatures and as an extension of that, how cryptography is used to secure internet communications. In the previous video, I explained how the basic cryptographic process consists of a plain text, the original message, the message that needs to be protected, um, and that is used as input to a um, encryption process. That encryption process also takes a key. The two inputs are combined, and the input, the plain text, is transformed into the cipher text. Uh, which can be freely shared because it means absolutely nothing uh, to anyone who would look at it. Then, as the message, the ciphertext, arrives at its destination, it is decrypted. At that point, the ciphertext is no longer output, it is input. We are taking a key as the input as well, and those two combined yield the original message, the plain text, again. What we said is if we use a single key um, to do the encryption and the decryption, we talk about symmetric encryption. If we use two different keys, one to encrypt and the other one to decrypt, we talk about asymmetric encryption. So the key there is symmetric encryption uses one key, asymmetric encryption uses two keys. There's also a mechanism in place that uses no keys at all, um, and that is called hashing or creating a message digest. So in a message digest, I can take a message and I can process it, transform it into a different output and I don't need a key at all. Now that immediately should raise some alarm bells because what we said um, as a result of Kirchhoff's principle is that the only thing that needs to be secret in order to protect a message is the key. And right now I'm saying there is no key. And as a result, we should not be able to protect this message. And to an extent that is true. Um, because these hash functions that take an input, a plain text, and create an output, a hash, without using a key, are not meant to ensure confidentiality of the message. What they are meant to do is to create an, uh, an abstract of the message, and basically a fingerprint, a, a shortened version, in most cases, of what the original message looks like. So, for example, I can take an image, and I can compute a hash of that. An image could be fairly large, the hash is usually fairly small. And that means that I don't have, for example, if I want to compare two images, I don't have to do an extensive comparison of maybe megabytes worth of data. I could limit myself to only a few bytes worth of data um, because that is what the hash function um, produced. It also means that if I use that to secure, for example, email, I could send my email message and in a second email, I could send the hash of that email message. Now, the recipient at that point can receive my email, recompute the hash because they don't need a key, and compare that to whatever I just sent them. If they match, the message has not been changed, and it's the original one that I sent them. If they don't match, well, at that point, either a hash has been changed or the message itself has been changed. Either way, something is wrong. The message shouldn't be trusted. Now, of course, that's good, but maybe I want to send you the message and the hash, but instead of sending you the hash as is, I'm going to encrypt that hash to make sure that no one tampers with it. And I'm going to use your encryption key to do that. That's the public key. You receive the message. You can then decrypt it um, and recompute your own hash, compare those. That's the basic principle where the message hashing function creates a much smaller representation of the original message. And instead of having to compare the big files, I can compare the smaller files by looking at their hashes. If the hashes match, the files are the same. If they don't match, they don't match um, and they're not the same. Now we can use this to create digital fingerprints. Um, and that means that we need to have a couple of extra requirements on these hash functions before we can consider them secure enough to do that. So ideally, we would like these hash functions to work on messages of any size. And it doesn't matter if I'm protecting a small email uh, that maybe only be, say, 500 characters long, 
or a very large file, um, maybe a terabyte large. Either way, that same hash function should work. I should be able to use the same function. So I can put in an arbitrary length input. What comes out of that should be a fixed length output. In other words, no matter of how much data I put into my hash function, I should always get the same amount of data out. And of course, that's a little strange because it potentially means I can have an unlimited number of inputs that map to a limited number of outputs, and that's just not going to fit. You know, if I have 100 letters but only 10 mailboxes and I need to distribute them, at least one mailbox is going to get multiple letters in them. That's the same thing here. That's the, called the pigeonhole principle. So by itself, that's not good enough, but we're going to add some requirements there. What we're going to say is I shouldn't be able to find what messages compute to the same hash. That's called collision resistance. In other words, if I give you a message and you compute a hash, you should not be able to find a completely different message that also computes to the same hash. Logically, that message has to exist, but you shouldn't be able to find it. Or maybe even better, you can choose freely. Whatever two messages you want, find two that compute to the same edge. Still collision resistance. It's different variation of collisions, collision resistance. They exist, but it should be very hard to find them. So that is a requirement for a secure hash function. What we also want to make sure is that if we have a hash, you, we can't unhash it. We can't revert back and figure out what the original message was. That makes sense. That's almost always the case because each message could have, each hash, I should say, could have multiple messages as an input. Um, and all of those are requirements on these secure hash functions. So any size input, fixed length output, collision resistance in different forms, and it's being a one-way function. If we have all of those requirements, we may have a secure hash function. And we can use that to create something called public key encryption. And so how does that work? Well, I can now go about and do just basically the process I just said. I can write a message, I can compute the hash of that message, and I can, I can encrypt that hash with my private key. I can then send that message out. Whoever receives it um, can decrypt uh, the message with my public key um, because everyone knows that and it recompute their hash. If they match, what they know is two things. One, the message hasn't been altered and two, it was digitally signed or the hash was computed and encrypted by someone who had access to my private key and that's me and only me because we don't share it. And at this point we have the basic principle of a digital signature. So it's really nothing more in many cases than the encrypted hash of a message encrypted against the sender's private key so that the sender's public key can decrypt it. Of course, we can do that twice. I can encrypt the message um, with the recipient's public key so that the recipient is the only person who can decrypt it. And then I can compute the hash of the original message and encrypt it with my private key so that the recipient can decrypt it, knows it comes from me. They can decrypt the original message as well because they have their own private key. And then they can compare hashes. And now I have the best of both worlds. I have confidentiality because I used the recipient's public key to encrypt it. I must use the recipient's private key to decrypt it. I computed a hash and I encrypted that hash with my private key which means that the recipient must use my public key to decrypt it. But when they are successful at using my public key, they also have the assurance that my private key was used to create that hash in the first place. And now I've protected integrity. I've also created authentication at this point because it was my public key that successfully decrypted this. And as a result, I've really layered some protections on there. That's the principle of a digital signature. So rather than encrypting the full message with the private key, um, we uh, just encrypt the hash and send the encrypted hash over. Now, of course, how do you know 
that my private key and my public key are mine instead of someone who claims to be me. And similar to what we saw when we talked about authentication and Kerberos in particular, we are going to rely on a third party to make those assurances. We're going to offer up our public key to a third party and say, can you attest to the fact that it's really me who is offering you this public key? And can you put your digital signature on there so that whoever receives your attestation knows that you verified that it is actually my key? That's called the public key infrastructure. The person who checks whether or not my public key is actually mine is called the registration authority. Once they determine that it is mine, they will give the certificate authority to go ahead to say, create basically a digital passport or a digital certificate for this person, which attests that this is their public key and some additional information as well. So that I can then show that digital password or that certificate to someone else and say, listen, this guy over here, this trusted third party verified that I'm really me and that this is my public key. You can send me things with that public key and I will decrypt them for you. It also means that if you can decrypt your signature, my signatures with that public key, it came from me. But all of that means that we have to have some way to map a digital uh, identity to a public key. And that's the role of the public key infrastructure. They issue certificates and you can just open up those certificates in your browser, for example, and inspect a lot of details in them. But that's the basic concept of the public key infrastructure and the certificates it issues. Um, it is a third party assessment of the link between a public key and an identity. And the concept of digital signatures, which is based on a combination of asymmetric encryption and hashing, is used to make that work. That's the end of this video. In the next one, we'll talk more about disadvantages of using encryption.